uh, that uh, hopefully will make of Western a, a, a central place, not only in Canada but in, uh, in the world, uh, on issues around big data. So we promise that we'll be keep working in that way, collaborating with people from all around campus and uh, with the doors open for anyone to come in and to, and to contribute. This being said, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Janine Deacon, who is the uh, Provost and Vice President Academic of Western University. She will do the uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's a it's a pleasure and it's an honor to be here. And it's just uh, it's just uh, it's great to see uh, so many of you and my colleagues from uh, across the disciplines. And uh, the first thing I need to do is I, I need to I, you may know this already, but uh, Charmaine uh, Dean, the Dean of Science, along with our colleagues, has worked very hard at organizing this day. And I had an email from her this morning to say uh, that she was ill and and. Uh, not able to be here and uh, I don't know how many of you know Charmaine but I hired Charmaine to be the Dean of Science one of my first hires when I came to Western and um, to have Charmaine be down and out on a day like this must mean that she's really that she really is under the weather because uh, she she would not want to, uh, to miss this this event and this uh, networking with our students and uh, just the, you know she lives and breathes uh, uh, interdisciplinarity and and uh, this is really just one more example of uh, of her leadership and participation, and, and so uh, I bring greetings on on behalf of Charmaine, and uh, and uh, hope that she is well soon. Now, Charmaine, because she's very diligent, she also gave me notes, but um, but I'm not going to use the notes, uh, uh, so don't tell her. Um, I, I, I just uh, just really a couple of opening comments. I, I want to. Uh, Welcome Adam and Allison who are here, who are the guest speakers. I just spent an hour with Eleni who is here from University of Alberta. Uh, and I, you may know her, she's an IRC uh, with IBM and the University of Alberta and we we're talking about big data. And, you know, I was reflecting on, you know, what am I doing, a kinesiologist, um, you know, how can I uh, uh, talk about big, big data? And I think we, we, were tra we were talking in the office that, you know, big data, um, data analytics, um, the issues of uh, volume, variety, and velocity. So you know I've read the I L O I. Um, uh, you know on on big data. This is this is. It, it doesn't really matter what the domain. And so we can all bring our our questions and our understanding of the domains within which we work. And so whether it's some of my people in robots that are imagers, and you think of the the volume of data that's generated in each of those uh, images or, uh, y you know, we were talking about the aircraft that's missing and the notion of the sensors and even though that's perhaps not a, a sophisticated uh, uh, marker, nonetheless it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a marker and if you thought about whether it's Rolls-Royce or Boeing or whoever has the, gets these pings, you know, the, the fact that there is so much data available to us to both understand our world and uh, ask questions about our world and, you know, another example, Juan Luis, we were talking this morning of, you know, our English colleagues and scholars who, who look at, uh, at, look at Shakespeare, uh, one, one manuscript, one, one monograph at a time and with digitization, the kinds of questions that could be asked, I mean, it seems to me not that we should do away with doing that, but it opens up a different door on the kinds of questions you could ask about a scholar's uh, body of, of, of work and that that actually represents the opportunity for, if not a paradigm shift, at least another paradigm that we could look at, at uh, data in. So, so it's data, you, I don't need to tell you this, it's ubiquitous, but I think it's, it provides a platform or the disciplines provide an opportunity for each of us to be able to talk to the computer, the people in computer science and elsewhere to help us solve uh, problems and build uh, build the, the sort of matrices that need to be built in order to understand the world in the new ways that we want to understand the world. So I think this is a fabulous uh, uh, opportunity at Western for our faculty and our students to display their work, for our students to network with people who live in the real world, work in the real world as some like to say, uh, to understand some of the, uh, the, uh, the challenges and the opportunities. So I, I really hope that you take the opportunity throughout the day to, to uh, uh, stand up straight and, uh, and talk uh, uh, with passion about your work and listen carefully about what, what the various uh, industries and, and players, uh, the kinds of questions that are asked out, outside of the university. This is a great opportunity to have the wealth of knowledge that's been brought to Western uh, for, for you to interact with uh, today. Charmaine didn't write any of those notes, by the way. 
um, but she did write me notes about about um, the, the the fact that uh, that we do have uh, many faculties. I think uh, I don't need the notes for this. When when we when the call went out for a discussion of big data on the the, the research clusters, uh, I think without uh, any exception, the number of faculties or uh, faculty colleagues who responded to the call from music to arts to FIMS to, of course, science uh, to, uh, to, to business. I mean, all the deans have signed off on the, on the LOI. So we've got this, this uh, great interest at the university. And, uh, and I think that you know, that's a great platform for us to move forward in this domain. So I don't want to take any more of your time uh, this afternoon. I know Adam's got a, uh, a talk to give here. And then you've got more interactive things. So again, congratulations to all of my colleagues, or each of my colleagues who's participated in putting uh, this day uh, together uh, congratulations and good luck with it I hope uh, I hope that it that by whatever metrics you use you find it uh, successful and to our students again please take full advantage of uh, the interdisciplinary environment that's been created here and the people our own colleagues at Western and those from uh, uh, from elsewhere who are visiting to take advantage of uh, of their uh, knowledge their perspectives uh, and their input today so I'm sorry I can't stay the job of the provost, right? Somebody said, we never see you. You might never see me. It's not because I'm not here. I'm here virtually all of the time, but they have me locked away <laughs> where provosts need to be locked. So I guess I'll turn it back to you or to Michael. Okay. And I, uh, I will just take my leave. So again, uh, best wishes for the day. Thank, Thank you, Michael. You. Thank you, Janice. <laughs> and, you, and you had a coat. Yes. So thank you very much. Um, I see uh, we have we have quite a diverse audience. I know I know quite a few of you, and I can already see that we've covered a number of the different faculties. So it's great to see such a wide uh, a wide audience. Um, as Janice has mentioned, uh, Charmaine is is under the weather, and so I have the distinct honor of introducing uh, Adam. <clears throat> uh, Adam Howitson is. Uh, So Adam is with Open Text. Is this on? Hello, hello. Yeah. Um, um, Adam is with Open Text, and Adam has uh, been involved in driving a lot of the innovation in Open Text's uh, enterprise uh, product division. Uh, he's been working with uh, a variety of customers in, in Open Text enterprise content uh, management. He's been working with uh, 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 enterprise markets, uh, working with companies such as SAP, Microsoft, and, and Oracle and their respective ecosystems and, and dealing with uh, open text products in those contexts. Uh, pri prior to this particular position, um, Adam was the vice president of products overseeing open text developers group, which actually is the group that's responsible for delivering tools to the community to actually enabling open text customers to uh, take advantage of, of open text in the platforms. <clears throat> um, he has previously also served as the Vice President of Program Management, Office of the CEO of Open Text, uh, leading uh, a variety of things, uh, program management office, global pricing, release engineering, and government relations groups uh, in Open Text. So he has quite a set of experiences in, in dealing with uh, uh, many of the elements and aspects of Open Text. Um, Adam also serves on the National Board of ITAC, which, for those of you who may not know, is the Information Technology Association of Canada. Um, it's a, a, a industry academic group that works with institutions locally and internationally on topics that are range from uh, engineering and computer science to international governance and policy. So he's well positioned in his, his uh, work at OpenText to talk to us about big data. And he has a breadth of experience with a, with a variety of other organizations. So, Adam, it's all yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I would say, in fact, that I am 
uniquely unqualified to talk to this group today. I'll explain why here as soon as we can. There we go. All right. Uniquely unqualified. Um, I didn't originally go to do any post-secondary education. Uh, I started a, a company in high school, about 15 years old. I sold it at 17. Um, and in a year when I was going to go have fun, take some time off, enjoy, uh, a friend's father actually said, and he worked at Open Text at the time, Fun worked for six months on a contract, I can use a hand getting through some IT stuff, and I like doing that. And you're just going to take the year and go do things you shouldn't do, and you're never going to want to go back to school anyway. So come on, try it out. It's okay, I went and got it, you know, tried it out. I've since gone back, of course. It's, it's, it's absolutely necessary that you have the... Uh, basis of knowledge to do what you need to do in your day-to-day -day job. Um, but because of that route, I feel as though I am indeed uniquely unqualified to talk to this group today. And I think that that's a very good thing, because as the private sector, uniquely unqualified individual, I get to say any old silly thing I want and get away with it. Um, and that's going to be some of what we talk about today, are any old silly things about big data. And big data is a loaded term. It's a loaded term in industry. It's a loaded term with our customers. It's a loaded term in academia. Um, perhaps the precise definition of exactly what data, big data is exists in this room today. If it does, someone tell me, please. But it's sort of nebulous. It's sort of nebu nebulous. We, we, we have an understanding of sort of what it is. Um, but I'm going to talk today not about what I think big data is or where it's going, but what our customers are doing with data. And I think some of it will probably surprise you. Um, OpenText is Canada's largest software company. It's in your backyards. It took me less than an hour to get here today. It's the biggest company that nobody has ever heard of. Anybody in here familiar with OpenText? I'm, I'm very impressed. That's excellent. That's excellent. That's great to hear. Every time you, uh, you know, scan a FedEx or UPS package, you're sending information over the OpenText network. Every time the European Central, Inter uh, Central Bank, um, uh, performs an action that requires governance or compliance. You're using OpenText software to do that. The U.S. Army and Navy use OpenText software. The Canadian federal government runs on OpenText software. SAP uses OpenText software. Northrop Grumman uses OpenText software. Roche Pharmaceuticals uses OpenText software. The world's largest companies run OpenText, and you've never heard of us. You'll find out why as we go through the presentation. Uh, at the end of our last financial year, it's about nine months ago, uh, we were a $1.3 billion company. We have had the unique and fortuitous path through the market in Canada um, to have grown at about 27% compounded annually over the last 10 years, which is phenomenal for any company. That's, that's egregious success, and we're very happy for it. We're very fortunate for it. 100,000 of the world's largest companies, 90%, 95%, don't quote me on the exact percentage, it's up there, of the Fortune 5,000, are all, all of them, open text customers. The world's largest companies, Largest governments, U.S. government, Canadian government, U.K., Commonwealth, Australia, Germany, all run open text. All run open text. Um, we have over 600,000 trading partners. I'm going to talk about what trading partners are and what that means. This is another type of data. So not only do we deal with unstructured information, gathering massive volumes of everything from emails to videos and rich media assets for companies like you know, Hasbro, Fox Studios, um, the New York Times, you name it. They all run open text. Uh, but we also deal with the transient, communicative, tacit interactions that exist around the information that we conglomerate into databases, the context that accompanies the, the work product, the document, the facts, the email, the instant message, the chat, the note, the discussion in the forum, the social blog, the tweet. Where does that information go in the world's largest organizations? I can answer that today. Um, but they are collecting, they are all collecting that type of information. And how do we make it usable? How do we make it usable? You know, the scale and growth rates are, are staggering, as we'll soon find out. So this is a little bit about open text. We're all over the world. We solve problems in Japan and in Germany and in Australia and in South Africa and in Tunisia and in the United States and in Canada. And we manage some 16 billion transactions per year on our cloud. Um, like I said, smallest company nobody's ever heard of. I am absolutely pandering to the audience. Come apply today. Um, <laughs> we've won all sorts of awards at OpenText, and I can personally confirm it is indeed a pretty neat place to work. So we're sort of pitching this. Some of this is marketing. 
Some of this is, is marketing and some of this is what we communicate to the industry. The customers that we're talking about, the world's largest governments, NGOs, and private sector organizations, put planning horizons out five or ten years. They are, they are monolithic organizations. You can't turn them on a dime. If we have an idea today, it won't be implemented as an, as an example of Siemens Corporation across 500,000 employees tomorrow, or next week, or next month, or next year. So we sort of talk in generalities you know, on our long-term planning horizons with customers. Where do you want to be in 2020? Where do you want to be in 2017? Where do you want to be in 2018? What are your strategic objectives? And as we do that, we're learning more and more that the numbers are staggering, right? Globally, uh, and we talk a little bit, we're going to get into the deep web and again, what open text does and where we apply our trade. Um, IDC predicted that worldwide data center traffic in 2017 is 7.7 .7 zettabytes. Worldwide, we'll have some 40 zettabytes of information accumulated by then. We're at about 10 today. The numbers fluctuate depending on which source you get to. This is an incredibly hard number to estimate, as I'm sure you can imagine. 40 zettabytes. Staggering. 92% of it was created in the past two years, or thereabouts. Imagine that. 40, or, or today, 10 zettabytes of information today available. The entire accumulated knowledge of the human race since written history began, yeah, about 10 zettabytes. We're going to quadruple it in the next five or six years. What does that mean? How can we use it? I'm awash in information today. I can't handle everything that's coming at me today. Maybe different for the students in the room, right? You were bathed in bits. There was never a day, perhaps, where the internet didn't exist. Right? Internet didn't always exist for me. Do I want to wake up every morning and check my LinkedIn, check my Twitter, check my, uh, go on, hop on Foursquare, go take a look at my Facebook, and then go over to another? No, not particularly. It's too much. I want the highlights, though. I want the highlights, though. So I need to rely on some intelligent things, and we see them happening, right? You can manage your subscription services, but these are all very colloquial, familiar sorts of technologies that help to reduce this massive wash of data on the public internet in our consumer world today and make them consumable for us. And that's, that's positive. It's a start. I, do, I was just sort of geeking out a little bit. If, if 40 zettabytes we think of as bits, on or off, and let's say that every one of them is turned on and every one of them is represented by an electron, right? So this sort of argument here is either there is an electron or there is not. We're saying there always is in this case. 40 zettabytes in a few years, you would be able to heft the weight of the knowledge of humanity if it was represented by electrons. It's about the same as the weight of a dosage inside of a nitro pill that somebody would use for cardiac care. That's astounding, right? That's astounding. I can't even fathom that. We could have the weight of our knowledge as a society. It's staggering. It's staggering. Most of, the, most of this knowledge, most of this weight, I use the Pfizer product there, by the way, Pfizer runs open text. Um, most of this weight doesn't exist today, and we're seeing it grow fairly prolifically, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to quadruple by 2020, and it's not just structured data. And I'm going to introduce a concept today of a divergence, or not necessarily a divergence, but uh, of a duality. There is big data. And I would argue, and I am only arguing, that big data sort of represents structured content. Uh, we heard from the provost a little bit about, um, sorry, word I'm looking for here, in structured data, uh, we were using uh, medical imaging was the analogy, medical imaging. It's structured. We know what it's going to look like. We know it's an image. We know it has to contain all of the pixels to cover the representative resolution. We know that we're going to store it in a particular format, and it's going to go onto a file system. Done. Easy. What about voice? What about audio? What about every voicemail ever sent at McDonald's Corporation? Is that information valuable to McDonald's? Almost certainly not all of it. Almost certainly not most of it. Some of it might be incredibly valuable. What about video? What about video that we capture? What about a fax that's sent? What about the information that's on that scanner that FedEx uses at every site? So what about the more and more unstructured content that we're producing? Rich media assets, video, audio, voice, speech. Speech recognition has been plaguing us for a very long time. And I think the point that I'm trying to make between big content and big data here is that big data is a little more structured. We can apply an algorithm to it. It's a set of coordinates. It's a known quantity in a cell in a database, although there may be massive volumes of it. We can apply an algorithm to it. But I can't necessarily apply an algorithm and derive meaning from speech today. We've been working on speech recognition to be able to extract that content versus data for 20 years now. 
Uh, anybody familiar with the Harvard Watermelon Box? Harvard Watermelon Box. This was probably the first attempt at electrical uh, speech recognition. And four circuit boards were composed to, to recognize a unique vowel sound each. They were put into a box on a table. When the word watermelon was set in proximity to this box, a light bulb lit up on the top. The average person uses about 10,000 words in their normal vocabulary, so this is a very simple problem. We only need to build 10,000 watermelon boxes. We have mastered speech recognition. We're done. It wasn't quite as simple as that. And this is actually you know, speech to text, true interpretation of speech, regardless of inflection, accent, tone, volume, etc. Um, background noise. We still haven't been able to solve it some 20 years later. But when we can, we can start to extract the meaning from unstructured content, where it may be perhaps speech, audio, computer vision. Um, how many of the speakers in this lab are comfortable? You're recording each one of them. What are their hand gestures? What is the importance of that? Where do they normally look? What is that representative of the seating arrangement in the room, of people's focus? Where are all the heads in the room looking? If they're down on the desk like this, it's probably a bad speaker. Um, all of that information is valuable. And, and, and the examples I'm using here are sort of in this classroom as we sit here today. But we know that in industry, and we'll start to look at the customers and examples of data sets that are out there, we're collecting this data today. We're collecting this data today. And it's all about context, right? That's, that's the challenge we face at OpenText, because we don't normally deal with that highly regimented database structured. It's always an integer between value n and x. It's going to be in this database. It will never have a decimal place. And you can incorporate it into all of your calculations as you see fit. We don't deal with that. So ich bin ein Berliner, famous speech, I am a donut. What does that mean contextually across the different media that we see in the consumer internet today? Well, on Twitter, you probably want to tell people that you're eating a donut. On Facebook, you're saying, I like donuts. On YouTube, you say, here I am eating donuts. Look at me. Uh, last FM, I'm listening to donuts. I like, uh, I like LinkedIn. I have donut skills, Foursquare. I'm eating donuts here now. I'm the mayor of donut. Instagram, there's a picture of a donut, right? The kernel of information in here is donut. The kernel of information in here is donut. Without the tacit interactions, without the context, without the transient data, without the speech that I am applying on top of the quantum of information, donut, donut isn't altogether very meaningful. And this is one of the major challenges that we see at open text as we sort of evaluate and we consider big data and big content. It's not just algorithmically, and we'll go through some examples of this, it is deriving meaning. It is constructing ontology for these different types of associative data. And it's only going to, again, further compound. I'm talking about video. There, there's so many things I can't even imagine, which is why it's great that I am uniquely unqualified to give this speech today. I can't imagine it. You're working on it right now. I was just in a room waving a flashlight at a set of sensors making music. I am uniquely unqualified to tell you anything about that, but it is going to generate data. It is going to be meaningful in our future. How do we tie it together with all of the other data? That is the fundamental challenge here. And it's not uniquely tied to you know, pattern analysis, machine intelligence sort of stuff. We've got humanities in the room. We've got probably people from business in the room, a number of different faculties. And all of us have to come together to solve this problem. This cannot be uniquely solved by engineers. I can tell you that right now. I have a capacity of a billion dollars a year and hundreds and hundreds of engineers at my disposal, and I can't solve it. I'm not like that. So this is a challenge for you, the researchers. And this will only get further compounded. Cars, wearable devices? What possible value does the data stream coming off a wearable device mean? I assure you there is value in it. I assure you there is value in it. We just can't conceive of what it is today. And that's the great challenge in front of us. We will start collecting data from wearable devices before we know what to do with it. Open data, begat big data, follow big data, is a part of big data, open data. A lot of the governments across the world are conducting open data initiatives. The United States, Canada, Germany, the UK, Australia, there's a number of them. The uh, list goes on and on. You can hop online and check this out. And they're taking data sets from all sorts of different agencies. You know, For us, it might be Environment Canada. Environment Canada does do this today. Um, uh, US Geological Survey produces huge quantums of data. Uh, Health Canada could certainly do that, right? We have to get to the policy of what needs to be properly uh, anonymized before we can dispatch that type of information to the, to the broader internet. But we're seeing open data all over the place. And open data is big data. 
it is big data in this structured algorithmic scenario that I think I'm describing to you, right? It's not big content, but it's big data, and not big content yet. And we use it to build all sorts of interesting apps that are viable commercially. They're useful out in the world, whether it's uh, FlightAware. Is my flight going to be late? What's the propensity of it being late? Should I consider booking an alternative? What's the best airline alternative? What's the waiting line at the kiosk? All harvested from big data. All harvested off of AS400 mainframes that still run the airline ticketing systems, believe it or not. Still run the airline ticketing systems in many cases. Census data, Ancestry.com. They didn't collect all of that because people wanted to hop online and you see that very nice family moment in their commercial, we sit down, we'll build the family tree. Um, they had to populate it with something first to attract people to their site and start to commercialize. Census data, open data, free, available. I was able to not, what's, what's interesting here too, and I think is, is the challenge I would throw down to this group as well today, You'll notice that each one of these solutions that has been commercialized and brought out into, into the real world, I think was the term, is a discrete set of data. There isn't anything being correlated to come up with some massive new meaning. Even in big data, we are solving things in silos still to a degree today, at least in the examples of commercialization that I've seen. Google Maps, it's a mapping service. Um, there's no way that they have people up with Google Maps backpacks in the Arctic Circle cruising around to be able to uh, drop orders and to be able to you know, mark uh, alert Canada. Um, so Environment Canada sends that information. Uh, Ministry of Natural Resources Canada sends that information to Google and they normalize it and they use it to do their mapping service. In the states, big data, open data from the government is affecting the educational curriculum using information to generate courseware to guide curriculums. U.S. farming, I love this one. Precision farming app. Precision farming app. It makes, that actually makes sense. So I come from, you know, sort of the, the high tech, I've only ever been in high tech. Uh, you know, precision to me means something very different than it means to a farmer. But yeah, precision farming. If we can increase crop yields, if we can determine the best location to plant particular types of crops. Did you know that in your back 40 acres you should be planting soybeans? In the front 40 acres it should be, it should be corn? There's value in that. So these are some examples of open data. Of course, Canada as well, data.gc.ca. Uh, and we have a lot of programs going on with the Canadian government, but I think the macro point I want to make on the open data is that open data is another example of big data. And open data is one of the first places where we see a big commercial push because it comes with government funding as well. The government wants to incite people to create uh, uh, applications, solutions, commercialization vectors on top of their government data sets. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, Germany is actually a leader in this as well. Uh, open data Deutschland. Uh, there's actually an Android store, Open Data Germany location, apps for Deutschland. Um, so neat, neat stuff, and it's going on everywhere. Um, still regimented, I think, still big data. We're not verging into big content. But this is what governments around the world are doing as well. And we're seeing it solved today by people taking it to commercialization um, in silos. I'm going to make an app that does weather, and I'll use the big data set for Environment Canada. I'm going to do an app that does travel, and I'm going to use the FAA airline data. I'm going to build an app that does silo, and I'll use the silo to silo. As we get smarter and researchers like you, working on technologies like you are, are able to start drawing correlations between big data sets. And, and the big challenge today is to even be able to draw meaning from one big data set, being able to reduce it initially to a meaningful set that you can perform a, a traditional sort of analysis on. What will you invent that will help us to perform these correlations and use multiple big data sets? So here's what's fascinating. Everything that I have talked about so far is this. Everything I have talked about so far is the public web. 4% of what's going on in those 10 zettabytes that we talked about. 4%. Everything you ever knew about the internet is wrong. This is Google and their search index. This is every site it represents that you can get to through the public internet. This is every big data set from every government on the face of the earth who is participating in open data, and it's 4%. The other 96% is where we live. It's where open text lives. It's where IBM lives. It's where Microsoft lives. It's where General Dynamics lives. This is the deep web. This is what you can't get to through a search engine. It doesn't exist out on the internet. It contributes to the sum total of human knowledge. It's private data. And it is extraordinarily valuable. Extraordinarily valuable. 
every menu board entry up, update item sale etc from uh, you know fast food vendors blueprint for aircraft for Northrop Grumman Lockheed Martin Boeing all managed inside of open text repositories none of which you will ever see unless you have that logo on your business card so how do you solve problems in that context knowing that everything that we've been Applying our trade on today, when we talk about the generalities of big data, is usually couched in the context of the public web. The deep web is where the information that is, you know, every email ever sent by Europe's largest bank. It's astounding. Um, large manufacturers, right? Automotive manufacturers, media houses, Viacom, you name it, right? All of these very large organizations need systems like this, open text or otherwise to store their data. And more and more, information is the trade. We don't produce material widgets at open text. It is only information. It is only intellectual property, right? The government doesn't broker and provide funding around material assets today. Today, they're talking about big data, and the currency is information, and we're making it available to all of you. So there's a split between the public web and the deep web, and the deep web is where we play. Which types of data sets? for open tech specifically. Um, I can't name every customer that we have. I can't name every use case that we have. As you, uh, you can obviously understand why, what we do for them, who uses it. Six of the 10 largest governments in the world run open text. 32 of the top 50 energy companies run open text. Everything from geological exploration to compliance to environmental health and safety management. Servicing uh, asset management in energy companies. And an asset for an energy company is a $6 billion refinery plant. That's one asset. All managed on open text. 10 of the 10 top pharmaceutical companies on open text. All of them. All of them. It was before, you know, back, this was maybe 15 years ago, I remember working at open text, and, and the use case was at the time that pharmaceutical companies would fill, on average, 11 tractor trailer transport trucks with paper documents from clinical drug trials and submit them to the FDA. So we've reduced that to zero tractor trailers and we've captured more data during the process. 10 out of 10, every one of them. Financial insurance, transport companies, seven of the 10 uh, of the world's largest manufacturers, six of the 10 largest legal, largest law firms, um, you know, the Baker McKenzie's, the Skadden Arps of the world, uh, nine of the top 10 media companies, Disney, Fox, we even do Major League Baseball entertainment, handle their media assets, uh, Australian Football League, you name it. Nine of the top ten food and beverage, so the drugs that you take, the food that you eat, the goods that are transported to you, your telecommunications, the way that you are governed, the energy that you use on a day-to-day -day basis and where you put your money relies on the little company up the road. So interesting, but each one of these 10 different industries has a massive wealth of data specific to it. And the types of data specifically for open text that we manage, when I talk about unstructured data and what we're collecting today isn't necessarily what you're looking at today, uh, but we should all start looking at it together. Um, we have something called the trading grid, which I will address in the next slide. The EIM suites are really where the bulk of the data is stored. And we split them into five groups here. And they accomplish five different uh, purposes and have five uh, different quote-unquote data sets, maybe a multitude of data sets under each one of these. Discovery is the concept of full text index, connect to every repository inside of an organization. You have 300 SharePoint instances, you've got data in SAP, you've got a medical imaging library, you've got uh, geographical data, tie them all together. That's what our discovery solutions do. Process solutions, business process, business process management, commercial lending over $10 million for a bank, anti-money laundering, anti-fraud solutions, um, all open text solutions all managed with business processes to ensure that you are compliant, things are created, things are audited, things are managed at the right time. Our content suite, sort of our bread and butter, this is where all of our unstructured data is stored. Every document, every PowerPoint, every email, uh, every PDF, every scrap of unstructured data, even social content. Uh, in our experience suite, we do Facebook for the enterprise. Open text builds the Facebook that the G20 runs, that the G20 runs. So the G20, the meeting of the world's leaders, where they share and plan what will happen with the world's political bodies and nation states over the coming X years, 
have a Facebook. They have a Facebook. It's a hugely, hugely secure Facebook on a platform that is not out on the public internet, but it's run by open text. It's run by open text. That's what social collaboration means to us on, on an epic scale, right? Uh, an information exchange, and that's sort of our, our trading grid, and the analog to our trading grid. $6.5 trillion worth of commerce pass over the open text network every year. It's just up the road in Waterloo. $6.5 trillion worth of financial tra transactions, worth of e-commerce transactions, whether it's EDI or whatever, whatever format, cross over the open text network every year. Staggering. Now, I don't know what our GDP is, but it's not $6.5 trillion. Right? But that value of information explicitly, like dollar for dollar, <laughs> that value of information passes through the network from the little company up the road. Um, Two billion faxes a year, who knew, right? Two billion faxes, still very prevalent for contracting, signing, countersigning, sending back, executing contracts, and 16 billion electronic commerce transactions, EDI. Some automotive manufacturer sends an order to supplier 128476J to get 27 ball bearings delivered at 4 o'clock this afternoon using 18 tent hardened stainless steel. That goes over the open text network for nine of the ten largest, or seven of the ten largest manufacturers in the world. Every one of those transactions is data. Is anybody here thinking about faxes, the value of corporate fax data in the context of big data, how we could discern patterns, how we could reduce legal costs by detecting that every time I send it to the lawyers in the UK, I have to send the fax seven times. It's probably a procedural efficiency to be gained there. Our agent recommends that you X. That's a hugely commercially viable big data sort of use case. Uh, Anybody looking at faxes? Anybody looking at EDI, electronic data interchange? Probably the world's most prevalent standard for commercial interaction, supplier chain management. So this is this is sort of where we live in, in in private sector right now, right? And this is where the money this is where the money is. This is where the money is. So it's it's good for this crew to to think about it. But is anybody dealing with these types of formats today? Is anybody dealing with business process management? Is anybody dealing with extracting meaning from audio clips from voice messages? Um, you know, is anybody working on deriving meaning from 10 million email per day? What could we tell a company? What could we tell a company about itself and how it could improve itself or how it could compete better if we were able to derive meaning and correlate meaning across 10 million email a day within one organization, 10 million internal email a day? What wealth of knowledge exists in there and we just have no way to harness it, tap it, understand it, utilize it, commercialize it, whatever the case may be. These are the challenges that are out there right now uh, in, in our world at Open Text. Who do we work with? The obligatory mojo slide. You name them, we got them. Like I said, 90, 95% of the Fortune 5000, huge set of the world's largest governments. Uh, but we'll put the obligatory logos up there. Um, we do a lot of partnerships in Ontario. Uh, I don't think we get down to Western enough. I'd like to. Always love and spend a lot of time. I've had the opportunity to speak at the Ivy School previously here. Um, we do a lot of interaction with the uh, University of Waterloo, uh, but private partnerships. Uh, Open Text works with Christie Digital, Bell, IMAX. Um, I mean, this is just a, a small subset, and we have a lot of Ontario customers as well that we can get researchers access to. Do you want to ask any of these companies, hey, would this be an appealing research project? Do you want an introduction made to them? Do you want to work with Open Text to get access to a data set that looks like that? If you think that you can solve a problem that exists in the industry today, we can coordinate that. We're just up the road. We do work with a lot of universities in Ontario, probably most prolifically and most geographically conveniently with Waterloo. They're in our parking lot. We sit on top of their football field. But you're a short drive away, and we'd love to have you up as well. So we partner today with, with a multitude of different, you know, uh, uh, UW and Stratford, of course, uh, we invested in. Um, York University, Carlton, Conestoga, Western, not as much as I'd like to. Again, I've, been, I've had the opportunity to speak here a couple of times, but I think that we could really look for opportunities to conduct more meaningful research. About 15% of our global workforce is in Ontario, um, which is huge. So this is an, an interesting point for a Canadian company. Only 5% of our revenue, of our $1.X billion a year, only 5% comes from Canada. Only 5% comes from Canada. So do you want to know what a multinational data set looks like? That's all that we do. That's most of what we do. So no need to, you know, uh, if we get into areas of focus or want to address 
big data problems academically, uh, it doesn't have to be within the data set in the university. You have private sector partners nearby. We want to work with you. Open Text is heavily involved with the Canadian Digital Media Network. I think some of you will be familiar with that. There's, I believe, 26 hubs across the country. Uh, WeTech, Windsor, Mars, Communitech, Waterloo, Stratford, all very close to Western. But our motivation is not purely academic. Open Text motivation isn't purely academic. And again, the beauty of me being uniquely unqualified is that I get to get up here and say things like that. We want to start companies close to our mothership in our domain of expertise. It is much to our benefit to grow an ecosystem of researchers, developers, uh, entrepreneurs who are working on solving the problems of big data and big content, those big fuzzy problems that, yes, I have a data set, but I can't even read the data that's in there. It's actually audio and it's speech and we can't do anything about it today. That's the problem we need solved. That's what I would challenge you with. Uh, and we have success in doing it, right? Uh, and this is just in, in the local region in southern Ontario. 83% five-year success rate, survival success rate, is staggering. Industry average is about half of that, a little less than half of that. So this is the open text ecosystem. I'm not going to drill into that slide. It's an eye test. But we do have $150 million worth of venture capital available for everybody in this room, right? So we announced in January our participation in the Venture Capital Action Plan for Canada. Open Text is participating in the $400 million fund of funds. We're a little short in venture capital in Canada, and if nobody in this room has noticed, what if I have an idea and I want to take it to market? Can I get money to do that? Will anybody take a bet on me in Canada? Or do I have to go to the United States to get funding? You don't anymore. Canadian federal government announced a $400 million fund of funds, and Open Text has announced its intention to close its own $150 million fund in the coming four months. So there's cash there available to solve these types of problems that I'm articulating to you today, and vectors for commercialization. And by the way, do you want to try it out on 100,000 of the world's largest customers? Because we can facilitate that. But you've got to contact us. You've got to reach out. You've got to be working within the domain. But there's huge opportunity there between private sector and academia. How do you start on this today? We introduced last fall a new platform. This is new for us. We've been a little reticent to put anything out on the internet around open standards platforms APIs for obvious reasons, because of where and how our software is used to do trivial things like run the world. But we did announce AppWorks, and that is our new developer platform. And it gives you access for the technologists in the room through a common RESTful API to our repositories and data sets. And it's free to access and learn about. You can get to it at developer.opentext.com. And it provides a common RESTful API facade for our core enterprise products so that you don't have to understand where we've built a product that has a, a DCOM API or has a particular, um, maybe it's, maybe it's a, a very rigid Chapter 5 SOAP specification. You don't have to worry about the discrepancies amongst those as long as you can adopt to a, a, a pragmatic RESTful pattern. You can now interface with the open text stack, and that is really new and really revolutionary, and I don't know a lot of other vendors that are providing that type of access freely and openly to the Internet for these classes of products and these types of customers and data sets. So pretty simple, you can build it HTML5, JavaScript, CSS, you can get it done in a few days. You can tie into a RESTful API, get some proof of concepts going. It's designed to allow you to do that. And if you need more information, of course, you can access it at developer.opentext.com. So if I'm just to hammer home a couple of points, then we'll open up for any questions from the room. Um, start thinking about big content and start thinking about big data where we're not even able to read or understand the data in the data set today. Because that's the problem of tomorrow. That's the problem that General Electric wants to solve for 2020, that we can sell, that we can monetize, that we can commercialize. Start thinking about working outside of silos. Think big, execute big. Can we get bigger than building what the weather is going to be like next week using only Environment Canada data? Can we correlate six or seven data sets and pr produce unthought of, unheard of value? Uh, through our analysis and through what we do in research. Interact with your private sector counterparts. You can help us to do things that we can't do, and we can help you to do things that you can't do. I, I think I have an idea for the world's next great automotive manufacturing app using big data. And I can help every major car manufacturer in the world to become 20% more productive 
and I'm going to retire on a tropical island with a coconut shell margarita. That's what I'm going to do. Unfortunately, I can't get access to the data sets that any of the world's largest automotive manufacturers use in production. I have no lever to pull to do that. But I might be able to email open text. Use us. We're invested. We're invested $150 million, $120 million. We announce on our close date again in the next four months. Engage with us. Reach out to us. We want to get you access to this. We want to get you access to our platforms. We want to hear about what you're working on. We want to help you to commercialize. We want to help you get access to what you can't get access to in academia. And we want you to help us solve problems that we can't solve in private industry. So with that, I'll pause there and ask if there are any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So I'm going to talk here about your uh, platform. I did not know about it. But how, what kind of data could be made available, and how, what kind of identifiers do you get for cross-referencing? You mentioned some of the work that has been done is in silos, and the identifiers are necessary for cross-referencing, and identifiers are bad because of privacy issues. Mm -hmm. What are you doing in this general area? That's, that's a great question, and I think that was that was sort of. Um, Questions too. One of them was around, great that you have a platform available, but what data sets are you going to do so that, are you going to make available so that we can perform research on it, or even so that we can look at it and see if there are opportunities there. Uh, and second question. Basically, if you do cross-referencing of multiple yes. data across silos, you need identifiers. And the identifiers, in order to be meaningful across organizations, have to refer to real entities. Yes. So if you refer to real entities, then you are non-private. Yes. So Great. Another. you cannot have automatically made the ID in company one yep. cross reference with magic ID in company two. Oh, it's it's far more complex even than than creating unique keys within a database. Absolutely. Um. So so to answer so excellent. So to answer question one, we will not ever 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 that I can think of, never say never, um, put a customer's production data set on the internet. We won't. However. If you want to reach out and say, hey, open text, could I enter into a non-disclosure agreement with you and would you be willing to ask the customer if I could have access to these data sets from these customers? That we could talk about. So you do get problems for doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would go to that developer.opentext.com. You can post on forums. You can engage. You can email me directly. You can call reception and say, I want to talk to somebody in engineering at open text. That's the kind of company that we are. And we will route you through. We will talk to you. Um, to the second question. How do we perform correlations? And even more, again, more complex than what, 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 is, the, what is the correlation of an object? Uh, and there are certain database constructs that can help us to map these correlations. We have graphing databases. I think there's a couple people in the room who are even working on these today. But there is no common marker. That's just it. That's part of the work that has to happen. So if I have every voicemail from Hasbro, and I've got every email ever sent from Hasbro, and I've got every Word document ever published at Hasbro, how do I start to correlate that? That's why I'm here today. Don't know. I don't know. We can do it in a relational way. We can do it in a re relational day, way today. I mean, we, we have those technologies. Those are the databases that we use primarily. We have some graphing databases and some other systems at open text, but we would do it in a relational methodology today. Is that sufficient as we start to pro solve the problems of big content? Absolutely not. What is the solution to it? I'd challenge somebody in this room to go solve it. So, thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir? How does one get a handle on how much value it's in a particular kind of interaction? I mean, do you publish any kind of, is there any kind of information out there that would give one, it seems the, the, you know, it's easy to think of different ways you might combine different data sets, but how would one ever judge which of those are turning out to be most valuable, or are there any sources out there? Well, I think the best way is just to, just to monitor industry. Um, and you'll see that, again, it depends how far out you want to get, but we see obvious uh, examples today uh, where we'll do a preference database with a viewed history database on net Netflix, tie it to a recommendation and say, you should probably watch this next. Pandora Radio is a fascinating one. Pandora is a fascinating one, and maybe as an answer to the key question. As I understand it, Pandora actually breaks down each song that you listen to into a sine wave, measures the pattern, detects patterns and the type of music that you're listening to, and Pandora doesn't actually know what genre, song, or artists you like. It only knows algorithm, algorithmically what sounds good to you as music. 
So that's, that's profound, because I think that that's a profound example of, of one example of correlation. I don't know genre, I don't know the content, I don't know what the lyrics mean, I don't know what language it's in, I don't know what time it's in, I don't know anything else about it. But I know that you like this type of sine wave. So let's give you some more of that. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure I explicitly have an answer to your question. You want to help me do it? So just help me to reframe. And, uh, is this working? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, I mean, is the uh, what is it that makes something valuable? Is it a mm -hmm. having a, a number of users that use it? Is it the yeah. type of industry? Is it? Um, That's a great question. So uh, in in my world, in 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 the, in the purely commercial world, it means that you're you're producing some modicum, some quantum of business value. You're making me more efficient. You're costing me less in inventory. You're making me faster than my competitors around a particular point. Is there a methodology to define and say that? An email pertaining to a Word document when emailed on a Sunday is more valuable than X, or with this particular topic is regarded as X within the company. So when the email comes from corporate communications and it contains these two words, right, uh, vacation approval, employees read it every time. When it contains mandatory compliance training, we have a difficult time getting employees to open it quickly. Um, so there are those types of correlations to try to define, but there's no, there's nothing today that I know of, and there may be in the academic world, somebody may be working on this problem, what in these tacit inter interactions, in this nebulous, unfathomable data, constitutes value? And the answer simply for me is, where there is true, explicit commercial value in the normal sorts of things, save me money, save me time, make me more competitive, um, but is there a more intrinsic way to identify and grade value of particular types of content? I don't know. I think that's another problem for this room to solve. Sir? Well, I guess part of it is that some way that the company file is stolen and how to discover that. I think the question is, is how, how do you, are they your customer? Do you, do they per participate, how do you participate in their insecurity and, and, mm -hmm. and private data become Malicious or, or public data? That's a fantastic question. You know, security is a big challenge for us. Um, uh, I believe Target is a customer. I believe. would have to confirm. I believe. Uh, it's, it's not our data set that went. I would certainly have heard about that. Uh, <laughs> was it our data set? Um, we face those security challenges all the time. Right? So any, any major computer science engineers in the room today? Anybody working on real hard kernel level? Go get them. Does anybody uh, appreciate that building Google is hard? Okay, so you can search the entire uh, public internet and you're going to give me a result in about a tenth of a second or less. That's hard. Seems like a hard problem. Imagine doing that, but every time you search, every single entry, document, image, scrap of text has to be cross-referenced against every user of the internet, every group that they are a constituent member of and every set of permissions that they have to that discrete piece of content, lather, rinse, and repeat for every object on the internet. That's what open text has to solve. So we do, and we provide encryption for data and storage. We have to provide encryption and security for data over the air in motion. We have to provide encryption, not necessarily encryption, but we have to provide a management and security around data when it's at the application layer. Some things must only ever be handled in memory. Some of them can never see a disk. Some of them have to be passed through the application logic without ever being written, put into a database, put into a log. Some of it can be, has to be five nines available. Um, so these are very complex problems. Uh, we do provide security from end to end, everything from access control to encryption over the wire to encryption at rest in the database to which groups can use which keys to access which content. When you perform a search in an open text repository, it's like the Google scenario that I stated. It's Google search on a massive volume of data. Every user. Every object, every folder, every permission set, and that's every. So if I provide, if I, you know, we're, we're both members of the open text intranet, and we both search for open text at the very root level, you'll have a totally different set than I, because we have different permissions. So we do accommodate it. Target's a good example. Um, even uh, so BAE Systems was hacked. The Joint Strike Fighter plans were hacked and stolen. They weren't an OT customer, but but there's been a number of these. Sony, the Sony network, three hundred thousand. Credit cards compromised. Um, there's been just a litany of them. So, so yeah, uh, it's it's critical in everything that we do, um, and the best way to manage it is from end to end. There can't be any weak point. We don't provide, by and large, we don't provide overall security services that will go right from the endpoint device. Is this iPad secure? 
everything over the air all the way back to the data center, to the database, to the power system. Is it all secure? We don't typically do that, but we will ensure that all of the open text infrastructure is secure. So, but it's a real challenge, big time, especially with the type of and volume of content that we deal with. Sir? I noticed that uh, very close to the start of your talk, you uh, very close to the start of your talk, uh, you had a graphic image of an Android uh, figure, you know, a, oh, yes, an, yes, yes. An, an artificial face. It strikes me that um, in an economy, a market economy, which runs on the basis of the volumes and density and speed of data that you've been describing, we're in fact heading towards an essentially a human system one in which uh, decisions are necessarily made on a basis which may actually be uh, incomprehensible, mm -hmm. uh, impossible to parse at the human level. And so that arguably what a company like Open Text is doing is in fact building an Android economy. Would you agree with that or not? Um, I wouldn't agree with necessarily that we're building an Android economy. Um, I agree with the statement that you're making, that these are machine-to-machine -machine solutions that will resolve most of this. Because, again, it's, it's, we're just simply awash in data right now. There's absolutely no way, even from a, we go into a customer site and we want to re-index with a full text extraction, every, every piece they want to deploy some new capability with their search engine. The amount of processing power required to catch up to where you are today is unfathomable in some cases. It is a realistic discussion and conversation that takes place between open text and customers to say, you want to do that, but you can never catch up. You can never re-index the data with the quantity of processing computer that is available today. Now, there are cloud and elastic solutions now available that maybe render that uh, argument uh, moot now, because we can, for a very short period of time, throw a truly unfathomable amount of processing power at particular problems. Um, with the various elastic cloud solutions that are out there. Um, so I disagree that we're building an Android economy explicitly, that these Android operations, these machine-to-machine -machine interactions, are what is going to drive explicit value. But I agree entirely that it will be machine-to-machine, non-human interactions, algorithms, methodologies that make the vast volumes of information that we gather uh, meaningful to humans. And there's challenges in that as well, as you know. It's going to vary. Uh, I'm on it. You know, I'll be I'll be honest with you. This type of interaction, this type of engagement, especially around co problems like this, can we have access to customer data sets? To they're new. They're new. You didn't used to have to have access to all of the customer data to solve a problem like this. You just needed to make the algorithm 23% faster so that the user got a response in one second or less. Um, there are new problems, and the way that we're managing it now is on a bespoke basis. What do you want to solve? Okay, that makes sense to us. Which customers do you need to talk to to accomplish that? Okay, we'll reach out and we'll see if we can accommodate it. So it's a very bespoke process. So we won't bite on every opportunity, um, but where there is research within domain makes sense to us, let's align on it. So to, to answer your question, it's a bespoke process. Reach out, you can do it through the developer network. I'll give you a card after this. Uh, Juan Luis has my contact information as well for anybody in the room who's interested. I genuinely don't mind getting 100 emails. Um, they pay me to answer them. Uh, so that, that, that said, it's a bespoke process right now. It's a bespoke problem. And if we want to ask, you know, General Electric for a data set, we need to cautiously do it together with their participation. Yeah. But, but we can facilitate the conversation, which I think is a big step. Okay. I'm going to cut it off there. Adam's going to be back, though. Um uh, for the round table. And I will not regrettably okay. this afternoon. But well, then he does get off. So if you send him an email, though, make sure you say what was it, vacation or brew, and he'll look You got it. it. So please, let's uh, join me in thanking you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have about three minutes before our next talk is up. If you